Welcome to everybody for the first and opening event in our Knowledge Exchange series titled Designing with Mass Timber. So we are excited to be opening this KE session with an opportunity to define mass timber methods of construction and to help clear up some of the terminology and kind of replace some of the industry myths with some of the facts. So this uh, design with mass timber session is one of five sessions in the CIAT Scotland East Knowledge Exchange series. So we launched our KE series in March of this year and have delivered 10 events in the early career AT support session, the retrofit se session and the building performance session with many more to come. So we will be launching our building modeling session on the 16th of September, and we hope you can join us for that. But for now, we are very pleased to welcome Soro Enzo to open and kick off our Designing with Mass Timber session and to keynote the start of our Mass Timber session. So like the other sessions, we will be delivering content around Designing with Mass Timber for the next couple of months, uh, maybe into early next year as well. So I am proud to welcome uh, Rory Dope from Store Enzo, a structural engineer that has specialised in innovative methods of construction and has optimised timber construction for architectural technology. So today, Rory is opening our mass timber session by describing and discussing the principles and considerations of designing with mass timber, covering the types, styles and things you need to know when designing with mass timber. OK, so before I hand over to Rory, uh, please do hang around to the very end to hear about the next three events in the Scotland East Knowledge, Knowledge Exchange series uh, under Mass Timber. For now, Rory, if you're ready, uh, please do steal the screen for me uh, and start when you're ready. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, we'll go from boom. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Rory Doak from Storenzo. And today, yeah, as John said, I'm just going to take you through um, some of the principles of designing with mass timber, uh, some of the key things you should think about, consider, and that sort of process of going through and ordering it. So I'll start off with the, an introduction to who Storenzo are, maybe to give you a background of where I'm coming from. Um, so ultimately, we're a renewable materials company looking to create renewable materials for every sort of sector. The idea is that anything made with a fossil-based material today can be made from a tree tomorrow. Anything from dealing with the climate emergency, going through to reducing your own environmental impact, and looking to combat things like industry waste. So this can be done with a number of um, solutions. So generally, we have quite a range of things at store ends, so everything from packaging materials and cardboards for things like oatly milk uh, and whatnot, all the way through to bed frames, uh, standard classics on framing to biomaterials. We're 3D printing with 60% wood and looking to sort of advance the potential of wood as a lignin-based material, and there's things like electrodes for batteries and whatnot. But my background is especially in wood products, so building solutions, so everything to do with sort of mass timber and all the sort of surrounding industries. But the central idea here is to do it uh, while looking at what a tree can do. So really there's a good view here about all the way the tree actually goes and what we can do with it. So everything from the parts that go into CLT, cross laminate timber, things that go into classic sawn timber, fencing, pulp, paper, you know, it's all there, you know, from a central tree, which is quite amazing. So today I'll sort of maybe give you an introduction to all the sort of construction focused things we can do with mass timber, and we can do questions afterwards. But yeah, introduction to myself. So Rudo, as John said, I'm a structural engineer by trade. I work as business development manager for the UK and Ireland. My specialty has been in volumetric modular construction and offsite construction spanning from the highlands of Scotland. Think, um, from timber frame into mass timber, you can see here. So a nice CLT um, module that you can see there. And then for today's session, I'll go through A, what mass timber products are there available, the different uses you can have there, design for manufacture and assembly, DFMA, through detailing and some building physics information, and particularly where you can look um, for information. You're probably not going to remember everything I say, so it's key you know where to look in those times. So we'll start off looking at walls 
what mass timber walls are on the markets and available. So the classic one you generally find is cross laminated timber. So CLT, just a large spanning solid timber wall that can be cut out and pre-manufactured with door window doors and windows cut out, sockets, cable runs and whatnot. We're also seeing quite a lot of LVLG, uh, which is re-glued laminated veneer lumber as a sort of high strength shear wall solution. Um, it's not quite as used as much as CLT, but it's got a new product that we're starting to see come onto the market. Then when we start to look at um, floors and roofs, again, cross laminated timber is a great solution here and probably the most common that we see. Uh, most commonly we see spans going up to about seven meters. And after that, to optimize the amount of wood in the product, we start to see people start to use something called a rib panel. So rib panel is a thin CLT deck on top with glue laminated ribs below. And that really gets you from your seven meters up to your 12, uh, 10, 12 meter spans uh, really well and economically. And then if you're looking for, again, sort of high strength solutions, LBL, laminated veneer lumber, is again a great option here. So we're seeing that used in the same way with a thin deck on top and beams below. And that's really going from like 9, 12, 15 meter um, spans, really quite amazing uh, going through there. And then when we look at sort of beams and columns, the classic one, of course, is sort of glue laminated timber and going in and going around in the industry. And that works for a whole range of solutions. Um, and again, we're also seeing laminated veneer lumber and those sort of high strength situations, sort of large offices, schools, or industrial halls. Definitely starting to see that industrial hall logistics space and uh, where the spans are your own 36, 27 meter, working really well for LPS. So going through that, um, I can then go through a bit on design for manufacturing assembly. It's probably a bit more of the, <laughs> the meatier parts of the conversation. A lot of this will focus on cross laminated timber and the machining possibilities and the modeling principles around that. But also very much apply to laminated veneer lumber and glue laminated timber as well. So starting off, you generally, manufacturers have general master panel sizes. So I've used the store Enzo ones here. But each manufacturer might have the same or slightly different ones. The idea is, as a manufacturer, they want to manufacture just master panels and cut your panels out of those. So as it goes, you always want to try and keep your panels within those standards to a width. So here's an example here of a 2.45 by 12 meter master panel with loads of smaller panels cut out. And this is really key, sort of keeping your mind about how these are manufactured. But ultimately, when you're sort of paying for the CLT, you're paying for the, the items in the blue. So you pay for that blue master panel, regardless of what the, the green panels are. And something to be sort of noticing, noticing here is that grain direction must be common for each of these sort of smaller panels in the green that going around. Having that sort of in your mind when you're putting together like walls, floors, roofs is really key. And I'll come on to that, how sort of modeling for waste, sort of adjust to that. But it's good to keep that sort of theme in your mind as you're going through. Then again, an example of something that's key to look for is what sort of um, truck bed size is going to be coming to the UK and keeping that in your design process. Actually, what you want to see is your most optimum is going to be that 2.45 by 13.6 trailer. It's the cheapest, especially when we've got all the products coming from like Austria and Sweden. And then if you need to go the bigger size, you've got 2.95 trailer, they're all the way up to 60 meters long as well. So why this is important um, is because when we look at that, we consider just a simple wall here with a door and window cut out of it. Um, it's all about looking at this and being, is this efficient? Because again, we're sort of paying this outer panel regardless of what's inside it and these parts here will just be cut out and they'll just become waste but i guess there's be a residual that we can use for other things and um, you can start recycle it into other panels or it'll be like biomass or whatnot but the key here is you want to optimize what you're paying for especially for large projects so taking a wall panel like this you might see that it's more efficient actually to break that wall up into smaller panels like this so you try to optimize the CLT that you're using, but you mean that you have a lot more lifts. So you'll have, instead of one panel lifting in, 
you'll have the six that you see here. And then if you nested that into the master panel, it'd be a lot closer together. And that's a sort of key theme there. But when you're modeling, putting together CLT, that if you keep to those standard widths and keep that in mind, you're making efficiencies and economic savings constantly as you're going through that process. But again, if I go back to this slide, it's about whether you want to lift one panel on site as well, like you see here, or six. And if it's quite an easy site and sort of program speed is there, you can definitely get the six panels on and you save the panels that you see here. Then moving on, something that's quite um, always quite an interesting uh, piece, especially for me. I love seeing the sort of machining sides <laughs> of the sort of CNC machines that we get with CLT. So every time you see a sort of um, door or window cut out of CLT, um, it's generally going to be done by a CNC machine. The machine just controlled by an operator going up and down the panel, being controlled by the computer. And we generally use the IFC 3D model to govern where it gets cut and where. But having a good mindset towards what machining is possible is very much going to help you in the long run to understand what is possible in terms of cutting out of CLT and what sort of shapes you can do. So starting off, I'll go with the sort of disc milling cutters and saws. This is a tool that generally works um, just horizontally. So normally around the perimeter of the panel, you come in and you do it and you cut down. So we take a panel sort of like this and a general um, connection method you get for these um, will be like a half lap. So we cut will be put in here. So this will be cut out. <laughs> Excuse my uh, pen drawn. Um, the idea is that this is the perfect tool to do that. As it will sort of come through down and cut along here and cut completely down the length of the panel. So it works really well. Or if you have to do anything further into the panel, it works really well for that. Um, so yeah, that's great. Um, going through there. And what we also have a, something called a plunge router. So in here, the plunge routers work both horizontally and vertically. So when we consider a sort of CLT panel, I'll draw a quick square down here. So you're saying, OK. And then what they're very good at doing are cutting out all the door openings that you have. But also if you have any cable runs coming through, they have a cable run coming up across. These would be very much ideal uh, ones to do. And the key sort of parameter of this machining tool is keeping in mind on the diameters which you can use. So generally for us, we only have like a 40 millimeter and an 80 millimeter uh, plunge router. So what you want to do if you have like a cable run or something is keep to those dimensions. So multiples of 40 or 80. And that means the machining and the processing of the panel will be a lot quicker. And you have a lot better um, economic feedback as well from that. Because it'll just be one run with a two rather than sort of multiple. And then going on, sort of drillings as well is really common. Um, drillings for things like lifting devices, uh, which we have there. Um, any screw holes or sort of high um, sort of visual screws are very good with the, the drill. But there's also here some constraints into the depth when we're looking at different angles of drilling. So it's a good one to keep mind on um, when you're looking at getting anything pre-drilled into the panels. But if the sort of angle is above 30, you only have 140 millimeters of depth um, to get there. And the smallest diameter we have is eight millimeters. So when you're laying everything out and start thinking about how you want to pre-manufacture and what pre-manufactured value you want to gain um, from CLT, it's great to have these sort of machining um, sort of constraints in mind. And then naturally we have a circular saw that you'll see here. So circular saw works really well also for doors and window cutouts. But if I go back to the plunge router really quick, as you can see, since it's a circular tool, you'll sort of get a radius um, added on, like a sort of curve that it cuts out on. So that either needs to be removed when on site, or we can re remove it in the factory with a circular saw option or a chainsaw option. But for high visual panels, you might find that it finishes too far, or there might be some um, marks left by the saw. So it's really a um, key item there is to think about what machining you want where and what, you, what things you're able to finish on site. For sort of high visual walls and whatnot, it's normally quite better to have that control on site 
to, to sort of finish them and do that second fix uh, really well inside. So of course, that's an interesting point. And now going on, maybe more tangible in the process is the sort of sequencing and delivery. Um, so for cross laminated timber, LVL, glue laminated timber, since it's an imported product coming in, but no matter where it's come from, how it's loaded, um, which way it's produced, is going to be key to keeping your program and keeping everything aligned between the supply chain and what's happening on site. So one of the ways you do this is looking at this building. You see the lorry on the left. So if we take these as individual panels, um, you can see that they just randomly put on top of the truck. And this could cause you difficulties if you want to, let's say, put the blue down first because you're going to have to lift this one off. Then you're going to have to lift these off. It's going to be quite a lengthy process. So when you order sort of mass timber, the key part is to work with the supply chain, people like Sorenzo, to make sure this is already planned in so you can go from what you have here into a simple process yeah. that you can lift the blue panels off first, then put the green and put the yellow. And this is really good to keep defined at the design stage when you're sort of modeling something up. So you keep that in mind, like, OK, yeah, we know these blue panels are going to go first. We want them at the top of the truck. Let's tell Storenzo so they can plan for that. They might have to be bearers or whatnot put at the bottom of the truck to keep the yellow panels simple. Or it could be a case of we might assume this if you don't tell us, but actually you wanted the yellow panels on top because you were going to unload it, put it onto the deck, then work from there. You know, there's another change there. So it's all about trying to align with your program and what the process is going to be on site. So that design for manufacture and assembly is so key to actually getting a successful CLT or mass timber project um, off the ground. And a lot of it's really well sort of defined and designed in through the 3D model and via the IFC. But it could be something as simple as adding in a sequence, a sequence label onto your panel. So you could say wall one is sort of panel six, and we know that's six in the sequence, and that's when you'd want it. And we also do a lot of work um, in the ordering process to give you drawings like you see here. So you can see what truck this is going to be and where your panels are going to be on that truck. So you can give this to a site manager, to whoever's going to be on site unloading the lorry and be like, here's the ones we expect to be. The top ones go this side of the building, top ones go here. And it's a lot more easier to sort of preemptively prepare. And when people talk about sort of 4D BIM and whatnot, this is sort of integral to that process. So that we can take what you're wanting to do in terms of a build sequence and have that ingrained into our factory approach, our production processes and how we machine the panels. It may be a case of this top panel has to have the visual face facing down instead of up. You know, certain things are really good to sort of tell us. So it's very much like an integrated process there. And it's a great, um, it's a great process for designers as well to be so integrated into that supply chain process. So you can see how sort of machining happens in the panels. You've got a control over how it's loaded and the communication is very much via the IFC model, um, which I think is, is uh, can sometimes be a challenge. Um, but a lot of times we've got a lot of freedom there to communicate in a 3D environment, which takes away any necessity for, um, I don't know, 2D drawings explaining something with you know a certain amount of depth. So misunderstandings are a lot less common when we're communicating in that 3D environment. And when I'm talking about that sort of process of integration, here's just a sort of simple process um, timeline of generally how models come into Sorenzo, how we work as a sort of supply chain for mass timber. Generally, an offer comes in. Someone might ask us for an offer. It might be one of our distribution partners in the UK or someone. And what we do is we take a sort of basic 3D model, outlining where the walls are, where the floors, where the roofs. We take that in. We develop it, we look at what processing, so what machining you might need for doors, windows, pipes, um, and we give you some advice on how to split the panels. Because if we go back to the, the previous slide I had looking at the walls here, we can give you advice on what savings you can have from switching from the left to the right here. You know, is it going to save you money? If it is, we can tell you um, how that's going to go. Or if you're engaging with one of the partner distribution companies, they can tell you that as well. And as you go through that sort of process of ordering and whatnot, um, you generally give your mass timber supplier uh, an IFC model as well. 
showing this would be a more developed model in that detailed design stage where it's showing sort of what cuttings you need on the panels exactly where your panel connections are happening and whatnot and they can take that in and start to assign machining processes to it they can start to show where lifting points are going to be on each panel so you could preemptively sort of guess um know where everything's going to be for the site manager to help you communicate with the people on site so generally this happens you would give a model eight to twelve weeks um prior to site delivery and as you go through there'll be a sort of model sent back uh, four to six weeks before site delivery then they would hope to get some sort of check and finalization from you again communication via the ifc to ensure everything is correct and we're discussing everything in that 3d environment which works really well and that's normally three to five weeks prior to delivery it could be closer if we take a, a, a such situation we're in now with sort of the supply chain demand it could be a lot um, closer in terms of timeline um, and then the panels the idea is that they'll arrive on site just in time we want to send the lorries out where they're going to arrive on site be unloaded and leave to minimize that sort of process and waiting times and it's really cool so yeah please if you have any more questions on that please uh, put them in the chat and we can get to them later it was quite a quick um overview of uh that processes of machining dfma and hopefully it's sort of, of value for you there the next part i'm going to come on to is looking at connection detailing and detailing around things like foundations um beam to beam panel to panel connections and a lot of this is coming from the structural timber association's advice note 14 which has developed a lot of industry experts and is really a great guide um, on how you should be detailing with uh, mass timber. So things like um, foundation detailing here, it gives you some really good diagrams here, but where you should put things like end grain sealing, which is a way to protect the end grain from moisture being absorbed up to, into the timber during that construction stage. There are different things like your DPC membrane, where to add insulation, what kind of insulations really work with CLT. It starts to give you really nice um, 3D um, images of that as well. So not just sort of uh, standard foundation details, but also things like doors, uh, windows, and detailing for moisture uh, are really important. I'd definitely advise giving that a look or having a look through it. I was going to put it in <laughs> the presentation today, but it is um, such a thorough guide and it would take in a sort of separate presentation itself to go through it. But please have a look. The guidance is great. I think the way they display it as well um, between sort of 2D details and 3D uh, is really good. And then going on, I'll go through a bit now on a sort of connection detailing. So this is probably your most standard um, connection detail with CLT. Um, and we'll see that um, generally quite a, sort of 60, 70% of the time with this half lap detail that we call it. So the panels just come in here. These are machined off site everything sort of fits together and you can do a lot of things with tolerance and the gaps here so you might want to add tolerance to a side that's non-visual to give a tighter fit on a visual side for instance and that's why this connection detail works quite well just as well maybe a bit more of an economic connection so it's called a sort of splice board here so there's a simple sort of plywood or timber board that joins the panels together so you see again that the it's a sort of um panel like this so hopefully you can see the drawing I am um, coming through here and in there you have just a board sitting in and that's either nailed or screwed into the panel like this so the the previous half lap connection was going to be more like this so they sort of slot into each other and it's not that secondary piece that we have for the splice connection so this works really well because it's simple it's quick and you get it done straight away but yeah naturally you have less of a visual finish um, onto it. So here's just a matter of preference in terms of how you want to um, see the details and how you want to sort of build that up on site. And then when we look at things like um, corner connections, very common one here is just a simple butt joint with joint sealant tape on the inside and outside edge here. So when things go together, you get an airtight joint as well. And generally a screw connection, at least with some flange head screws, and put it on there to build it in tight um, and get that sort of air tightness that is so sort of um i guess key and so so achievable with clt construction since it is a sort of mass timber panel and um, works quite well and also added in a sort of a 
rudimentary drawing of another sort of um, corner connection detail that I see quite often. And again, here, if I'm looking at this, um, it's the same discussions I had before for the half lap connection. So you can have a sort of connection uh, it's like this. And say we have uh, this red zone, which is the, the visual side. And you see the sort of uh, light orange zone, it's the non visual side. You might want to add just a wee bit of tolerance here so that you have um, space in this direction to move it to ensure this visual edge is always going to be um, what you need it to be. And this just works just the same here. So we take it on the outside edge here and you add your, your tolerance on the edge here. Um, it's quite an uh, integral one. It's really key. So when we talk about mass timber panels, the machining that I mentioned before is being done to you know three to five millimeters and um, tolerance, which I don't know, could go down to even like one or two mil. But when you get let's say four or five panels in a row, all sort of two millimeters out, that all sort of compounds and gets bigger and bigger. So it's good to have these sort of local tolerances where you can constantly control that as everything goes together. Um, it's really key. Now when I look at things like sort of um, CLT with mass timber beams underneath, there's a number of different options that we can have here. I've included some also for sort of hybrid structures, which become more common, um, especially in the UK and Europe. There's a number of different connection details here that you can see. Um, it's all a simple case of how you want to sort of put things together. Um, do you want a continuous panel on top or do you want it to split on here? Or you could have a situation was if you have double spanning and um, cross laminated timber, which works really well, especially um, if you're thinking about things like disproportionate collapse, um, it works really well there. And also if we're thinking about um, efficiencies and sort of transport and, and machining, the longer panels and lifting as well on site, longer panels definitely work um, a bit better there. But some good details here that you can look around in terms of, sort of integrating with steel, they're coming in. And again, for me, it's always a case of tolerance and making sure you've got the right tolerance in there. It is a pre-manufactured um, product. So once it comes on site, you do have a bit less flexibility than you would if you were just um, stick building or framing on site. So that's why the sort of process of detailing and the sort of role of an architectural technologist is sort of so key, because this is where all the value is made. It's in the model, it's in the procurement process, and it's in the sort of tolerances that you leave in these sort of joints. And then pushing on there, we start to look at sort of beam to wall um, joints here. So everything you get from sort of concealed um, plates, screwed through here into the CLT wall, you can rebate the panel or the beam into the panel, like you can see here. And again, that can also be a great way to, to measure tolerance, depending on, on if it's a visual edge or not. And you can also have a simple one of having a sort of column and beam situation here, that tied back to that CLT face. Um, so these work really well. And to, at this point, in sort of mass timber market, there's so many solutions, um, especially to this interface that I find um, that you can use and find. And there's a lot of sort of fastener companies and connection companies there developing new solutions sort of every week at this point. <laughs> so as much as I'm going through here, it's very definitely worth using this as a base, then explore off of and going through there. And this is actually some connection details that I found recently. Uh, worked really well when I started to do some more work into industrial buildings and those long spanning structures you see, you know, the sort of 30 meter spans um, of buildings. And these are apex connections uh, are extremely useful um, for CLT. So things like apex connections you see here where it's sort of, you can screw this on in the factory um, and have it bolted on site works super well. Anything here where it's sort of a plate connection, um, the raw timber frame building in the south of England uh, from low timber frame and pyramid structures, a really cool example of sort of large spanning timber um, structure with a nice apex connection in there. But these are super interesting and I think such a, a good space for, for sort of timber construction to be moving into. Yeah, really cool. And then something that um, is really cool is all oh, stairs. Uh, so mass timber stairs, they're going quite often. And um, for me, it comes into a sort of simplicity and that connects detailing when you have your sort of solid slab stair, stair that you have here, and the connection system just being like this, um, simple angle brackets or um, wooden plate 
on there just to connect and screw in back to a sort of timber landing uh, of some sort. Or you're going to have it sort of screwed back into two walls, like you see here, and the individual treads cut out. And again, here's just an optimization of um, how much waste do you develop from cutting out of this CLT master panels, and what's the most efficient for you on site. And um, again, things like this can be created by sort of mass timber suppliers um, in their factories. They are generally doing a lot of, sort of solid mass timber stairs now. Um, so really interesting product. But again, you can have simple sort of glue laminated um, sort of stringers coming off it with CLT um, treads on top. Both sort of work quite well and quite nice in there. And then going on, I'll go through some building physics stuff now. Generally, it's just a really good overview as a, a great way to start off and looking at uh, mass timber and everything it can do. Um, so thermal performance, acoustic performance, and I'll give you a couple of links, um, especially for things like acoustic performance and build-ups. And um, there's a lot of good sort of um, non-supplier information there. It's done a lot of good academics. Um, it's good to sort of have a sort of channel into that. But we start with sort of thermal performance. Um, here's just a, a quick graph of looking at the a cross laminate timber 160 millimeter panel um, with insulation on top. Um, and as that insulation increases, um, you can start to sort of decrease in U value. So you can start to pinpoint potentially how much insulation you might need for a cross laminated timber um, build up. Again, this is quite uh, just generic and just um, considering normal products, but can be more specific to your situation. There's a sort of multitude of U value calculation tools um, out there with cross laminate timber included. And it's worth noting at this point as well, if you're looking for certain values for cross laminate timber, like uh, mechanical properties or material properties, and um, the ETA document that each um, cross laminated timber supplier will have generally has all the information. There's no sort of European harmonized standard yet for cross laminated timber. So that's where you want to find all your information is in that ETA document. It's generally on most um, CLT supplier websites uh, and everything. Generally, most things would be the same. There might be slight tweaks and things like um, sort of thermal conductivity and whatnot, but generally all sort of the same. And again, here's just some examples of how cross laminate timber might compare to things like timber frame. Um, and this is taken from our building physics guide by Storenzo um, online. I can send links after uh, if you're interested. But this Good example looking at generic timber frame buildups, cross laminated timber buildups, and looking what's the comparison in terms of depth and thickness. You're looking at brickwork and plaster again on top of that. Go through there. We also have a huge amount of different buildups. I have a, I think it's about 60 buildups we have online um, at the moment from external walls. And um, you can see here, give you an indication of what the product fire resistance is. U value you get from this particular build up, the acoustic rating, so our W value for external walls and internal walls that you see here. So, what would be the product fire performance of this panel? What's U value? What's the acoustic? Quite a nice breakdown, so you can see simply um, how it goes. And then there's also a multitude of sort of floor and build ups here. So, by certain acoustic values, U value, again, a fire resistance um, value for the product itself. And um, this works really well, um, especially I think uh, acoustics, um, it's quite a common question for us. And there's only a certain amount of buildups that we have uh, on file now. And if you were to look for more, if you wanted sort of a range um, of buildups, you can start to look at places like this. So Lignum Data and Data Holes are a great sort of library of different acoustic buildups. They give you great values for things like sustainability, um, a lot of from approved calculations or testing. And it's really just a, a great source of information when it comes to um, cross laminated timber buildups, solid woods, and timber cassettes, sort of mass timber in itself. And um, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. I uh, hope that was useful um, for you all. And yeah, you managed to get something quite good for it. Um, thanks very much. Uh, for your time, it wasn't too too short. Brilliant! Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Rory. Let me just steal the screen back off you there. Um, I can take take over. Um, so, yep. Let me move this little guy back across. So this appear on the recording.
But thanks, thanks very much, Rory, yep, indeed, for sharing your knowledge on um, things we need to be aware of uh, to design with mass timber. If you could, uh, sometime this week, if you could fire across those links for me to some of the documentation you're referencing, we could then post them on the LinkedIn page. That would be be fantastic. Um, Absolutely, yeah, always. Brilliant. So thanks to everyone today for for joining us. Um, and as I described at the very start, the, the questions that have been posted so far, I'll, uh, we'll send them to Rory and give him a, a couple of days to, to respond to your questions. And we're, we'll post the answers on the CIAT LinkedIn page under the flyer for this event. And we'll, we'll pin it back to the top again when that, when that happens. Um, there are uh, still outstanding questions to be answered for the previous event. So they'll go on sometime later on today. Uh, so. Also, do feel free to reach out to Rory and Sora Enzo to continue this interest area in this topic. And thanks again to Sora Enzo for volunteering their time to support this knowledge exchange event. So before I close off this session and say farewell to you all for another week, uh, I want to remind you of a couple of upcoming knowledge exchange events under our mass timber sessions. So on Thursday, uh, sorry, Wednesday, the 18th of August, CIAT Scotland are collaborating with the um, Construction Scotland Innovation Centre to bring you another knowledge exchange event uh, in our mass timber session. This one will be something like a mini conference uh, and this will be um, we're hearing from speakers from CSIC, Transport Scotland, 360 Architecture, Ecosystems and uh, Building Research Solutions. So here the team will be presenting their work from the Near Home Project uh, where they used mass timber, CLT, DLT and NLT to retrofit shopping units with office space to decentralise the workforce and promote growth in small towns and villages. Then on Wednesday, the 1st of September, CIAT Scotland East uh, are collaborating again with CSIC to bring you uh, another mass timber event. So we'll be hosting speakers from Edinburgh Napier University's Centre for Offsite Construction and Innovative Structures, and they'll be introducing us to their newly developed BIM plugin for the specification of homegrown timber in architectural technology. So this will include a tutorial from their uh, for their early design stage LCA tool and members of CIAT Scotland East are currently beta testing this tool on the lead up to the event. And then finally, uh, on Thursday, the 2nd of September, uh, the Mass Timber Academy are starting their online short course with uh, four or five afternoons uh, and evening sessions on designing with DLT, Dowel Laminated Timber. So this will run until the 30th of September. Uh, CIAT Scotland East and Scotland West regions, including the two aspiration groups uh, for both regions, are financially supporting this design support course, allowing uh, the Mass Timber Academy to discount the cost of this course to ATs uh, studying, living or working in Scotland. Also, the HCI Skills Gateway provide further discounts on the, the cost of this course for people that qualify in their priority groups. So more, infor more information and more detail on that short course will uh, arrive on our CIAT Scotland East LinkedIn page very shortly and emails via CIAT HQ. So until next time, uh, and on behalf of CIAT Scotland East Region, uh, thank you to Rory and Sorenzo, and thank you to, to all of you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this session, and we look forward to seeing you at our next one, which is next next Wednesday. So until then, bye for now.